Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here, and thanks for skipping lunch for this. I know that lunch is already out out there. Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, a large-scale knowledge graph platform we're building at Apple. Uh, it was a large team uh, of engineers, ontologists, uh, data scientists, machine learning experts. So it's a really large team and uh, led by my colleagues, Theory Katsinas, Vishnu Kunda, Jeff Pound, Xiao Guangxi, and, and Mohammed Solomon, and, and many others that we couldn't put on the paper. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having the honor to lead the team in, uh, at Apple. So knowledge graphs, many of you um, are familiar with the concept. It's an it's idea to have a lot of heterogeneous data sets about sometimes vertical domains like you know, health or products, but sometimes open domain uh, like Wikidata and Freebase and, and other knowledge base that you might be familiar with. And the idea is, can we build uh, a large scale open domain uh, graph that is capable of having up-to-date information continuously built all the time and can st stand behind uh, always on services like Siri, for example, and other services in Apple. And uh, that's why the word knowledge construction might mean different things to different people. Um, in academia, you might uh, find knowledge construction always referring to link prediction and value prediction, for example, in graphs. Today, it's going to be a little bit different. It's more about data integration of many, many public heterogeneous sources and how to schmooze them together in the same graph and use that to power a lot of services. Some of those are query database-like services, but many of those are also machine learning and, um, um, and kind of a little bit more intelligent services uh, that I'm gonna talk about. So in a nutshell, there are kind of two buses to, um, of information flow into the knowledge graph. We start by sources that come in, in their own namespaces in own representation, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. And I would like to put them all together under the same controlled vocabulary or a controlled ontology uh, that is kind of ours. And that will be our uh, connecting glue such that everything represented exactly the same way. And everything here might be a song, a product, an artist, um, a sport, and, and uh, a player, and so on. The blue batch uh, line is more familiar to database systems people, which is you know, the ETL coming up with some transformations, uh, aligning these sources, unnesting JSON objects, and what have you. All of this kind of shabam that we need to do to kind of read a source that we never saw uh, before. But once we've done this, we put it into these linking uh, pipelines that the ability to be able to say, this representation of this artist from source one and this representation of artist of source two are probably the same and we should put them together. And then we fuse this, fuse this information together and then shove it into the graph. So these are kind of a more familiar story. Many of you have seen it in, in different contexts. Uh, another story that might be familiar, but maybe not together, is the real time update for this graph. So imagine that you're asking, um, uh, Siri, for example, um, you know, what's the score of a certain game? And you don't want really to wait two hours till the game is ingested, the score get linked, and then make it to the graph, and then finally have available to you. That the, the game will be ending, especially we are in, uh, in the soccer game, uh, in the football, football um, uh, season. So what we do is we would like to get information passing as fast as possible, patching the current knowledge graph, so the knowledge graph is recent, but then we take our time to correct this wrong possibly wrong information in the next uh, cycle of the batch. So I'm gonna leave you with that story and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a little detail, but that's what I want you to kind of remember how we continuously um, uh, uh, up, uh, update and build a very large scale knowledge graph. When I'm saying large scale, it's like much bigger than full Wikidata, for example, much bigger than uh, any public knowledge graph you, you kind of have an access to. Um, so the reason I usually show this picture is to try to convince you that there is a lot going on behind the scene to be able to get something like that going. Uh, and that explains the, the, you know, the many, many, many years that have been spent in this. The red boxes that you see 
uh, refer to the activities that I talked about earlier. So there is a knowledge graph construction pipelines. There are graph engines that is responsible for querying and building views on top of this graph because we never actually let anybody touch the graph itself. In fact, the graph itself is not one database or it's not like one triple store but it's more of a kind of a poly store with multiple replicas and so on. So it's extremely hard for direct consumption and it sets, sets behind a view engine that is capable of generating feature store, graph embeddings, uh, uh, and, and other kind of views of the graph or products of the graph for downstream applications. The blue boxes refers to the mini pipelines that does kind of a more uh, ML services. And I'm gonna talk today about uh, a couple of those uh, services. And you, you'll see me using live and batch. Uh, and just, just to, dis to distinguish between what's going behind the scene at construction time and what's being served live behind an online service that is going all the time. Uh, for example, like Spotlight or, or CD or Music Search or what have you. So the platform itself is, is, a, is a kind of a collection of multiple um, technologies. And um, the reason I mention them here is just to appeal, like if you're working, if you're working on that domain, you're, you're, you're closer to Knowledge Graph than you think. Uh, so at the bottom, there is all of this uh, infrastructure of data systems, data integration, data cleaning, value prediction, structure prediction, um, linking model, record fusion, knowledge fusion, and what have you. There's tons of papers around each of these terms in, in, um, in the data systems community and the SysML communities. But there is a streaming layer that I talked about earlier. The two other boxes is um, our story for coverage. There is information coming all the time and it's not usually in Wikidata and it's not in one of the data sources that we have access to. So what we have to do is to go and play fetch for all the missing information that either our users are asking about and we don't have a clue what they're talking about, or we realize it's a gap in the graph. For example, I don't know the birth date of a certain singer and you know, people must have, will ask about that person, can I go and extract it from somewhere? And that's kind of the open domain knowledge extraction, uh, which you know, a lot of NLP activities um, uh, that, that, um, that's kind of, um, uh, kind of well studied, but at the same time have the practical challenge of being an open domain and, and, and you're kind of um, die by a thousand cut by you know, going and building specific adapters for everything. So we're trying to do kind of a one layer that's able to continuously looking for gaps in the query logs and in the graph structure and going and build automatic adapters for it to go and fetch it. But then you're responsible for the recency and the accuracy of this data. And that's a big thing. So you, some of you might, like when you use Siri, for example, and you ask Siri something, um, it will reply by X saying Y. You know, according to Wikidata, that's what's happening. And that attribution is extremely important for fidelity, for liability, for transparency of information, for auditing. When we extract our own data, then it becomes kind of our own data, and, and now you're responsible for its fidelity. So let's talk about what that looks like. So here's um, an example of two sources, A and B, talking about exactly the same person, in this case, uh, Connor McDavid. And you can see they have like slightly different representation. Um, you know, some of them are missing uh, the goals of Connor McDavid, for example. Uh, some of them uh, are saying that he's a, he's a hockey player and the other one is not. And the idea is to kind of put them together into one new namespace and now our knowledge graph will have one representation of Connor McDavid. And then you're responsible for either corroborating these sources, information are aligning, good story, no problem. And then you have to worry about places when they don't align. So source A uh, is talking about a different birth date. In this case, the birth, both of them agree on the birth date, but they are disagreeing on format, that's easy. But if they're not agreeing on the actual birth date, then you're in trouble and we need to be able to pick one or seek help from our uh, human in the loop or find a third source or trying to appeal to the source fidelity to be able to uh, change this. And then we expose this graph, as I told you, in a variety of ways. We can put machine learning models built on the graph, uh, graph embeddings, indexing of the KGs for like key value stores, such that when I say something, how many goals does McDavid have? Um, then we will be able to kind of understand what is it that you're talking about and then land on the correct McDavid in the graph and then retrieve the live uh, graph query uh, 
uh, result, which is 43 goals. And if some of you are saying, wait, wait, why are we doing all of this? I can just put it in BERT and, I, and, I, and I'm done. And uh, this is not about should I do this KG way, question answering in the KG way, or question answering using uh, transformer uh, foundational models at all. This is not a comparison between these two. This is basically what do we do to extract uh, information from the knowledge graph when I have natural language processing on top. It's not to build a question answering system, but how to kind of bridge that gap and, and, and retrieve data. And you need some machine learning layer that does semantic annotation, mention generation, named entity uh, recognition, and then finally a structure query retrieval for the graph. Um, so let me very quickly tell you about the three big pieces that I'm gonna be uh, talking about very quickly, knowledge construction, and um, it's basically uh, building this extended triple format. One of the big decisions that you need to make for uh, a knowledge graph is the expressiveness of the ontology that you're gonna be using. And you can go crazy and build a um, super expressive model that will be impossible to reason about in any um, uh, uh, efficient way, but also will not lend itself to linking because the deeper representation it is, the harder to link things together. So in Saga, in this particular um, uh, um, implementation, we chose what we call extend triple format, which basically nothing but you can talk about things like for every entity, for everything that you're talking about, you can talk about some properties and properties around the properties and that's it. You cannot really go further than that. You don't have like qualifiers over qualifiers over qualifiers forever, which for example, allowed by Wikidata model. And that limited expressiveness allows us to do what we need to do in terms of linking and construction, and question answering for all our use cases. And that's why we stopped at this expressiveness, which give us kind of a, an edge in performance. Entity linking, I'm not gonna go through it, but uh, because it's usually also known as deduplication. And I think two years ago, I gave a talk about like a whole company that, that I founded that does deduplication and schema mapping. So we're not talking about that today. We're talking about um, this particular example where we, even if you link things, so I told you, for example, Neil Young is birthplace is Toronto. And I left Toronto as a string Toronto. In this case, you actually haven't, in, in, you haven't uh, consumed anything meaningful in the graph because strings actually, the only way to uh, access it is via text indexing and so on. Then you have a triple store that looks like a knowledge graph, but it's really a document representation of a bunch of text. And what you really want to do is even uh, when you're ingesting an entity called Neil Young, all the strings that are mentioned in Neil Young representation has to be linked to entities in the graph as well. And the question is how to link this Toronto string to the city Toronto, not to the song Toronto or the band Toronto or the shop called Toronto, because all of those entities are in the graph as well. And in this case, we use kind of this contextual uh, uh, reasoning that use kind of context from the graph, context from the query, context from the input, and, and it's a kind of a transformer model that allow you to do this. There is a paper, by the way, in Sigmund last year, Industrial Track, under the same title, so go and look it up, and it has all of these kind of nice details if you're excited about like how we actually do this. But this object resolution allow us to, as I said, link to Toronto the city, and that kind of unleash the power of uh, asking questions like how many artists uh, was born in the city Toronto and, and, and so on, because you know, that's when you constructed the graph. The entity fusion I talked to you uh, a little bit about, like once you linked and you, you constructed the graph, you need to kind of worry about uh, fusing all the entities. The only thing that I'm gonna tell you about here, it's kind of a more, um, you know, it's very hard to automate this. And oftentimes you have these automation per domain. So I know how to, for example, if I have a bunch of different salaries or different net worth for a celebrity, you might wanna take the max or you wanna take the average or something like that. But when you are the birthplace is two different cities, you cannot take the average of two cities or you cannot say uh, they are born in these two cities, they're born in one, you have to choose one. But genre of a song, you can say all of these genres are okay. So fusion is kind of very kind of entity type dependent if you like, um, and, and you need to worry about that. I'm gonna touch very quickly, like, you know, so far we constructed the graph. We built adapters, we took the data in, we linked all the information, we resolved strings. It's great, it looks like a graph, and, um, but still not accessible at all. 
So how do we query such thing? And if you are a data systems guy, you will be excited about this because it's one of the few kind of places in which a poly store is actually needed. So depending on the workload against this graph, and I can tell you just a little bit of different workloads. You have serial queries and spotlight queries and service queries from all the domains that is billions of queries a day with 20 millisecond SLA. That's, that's one domain. There is another workload that requires to do gap analysis and uh, uh, go through the graph and, uh, and kind of dice it and, and do kind of OLAP style to understand what's missing and the fidelity of the graph and if we have bias and if we have injustice or anything like that. And that's kind of an OLAP workload. And we have machine learning work workloads like building, embedding, and vector representation of every entity. So we can give it, we can give entity representation to these representation layers of all downstream ML. And if you think you can have one system that does it all, I would, you know, come and talk to me. And we couldn't, so we built multiple versions of this graph to be able to um, uh, talk to all of these uh, kind of different workloads. The graph engine is capable of giving views. You know, so behind that kind of uh, fancy picture, you, you know now that it's just logical, it doesn't exist. What exists is like many storages that represent that graph. And then from that, I can give you relational model, I can give you subgraph, I can give you embeddings and representations and so on. Um, so, so let me talk about the live query of the graph. One of the cool things that we learned as well, that in order to, um, eh, respond to billions of queries at 20 millisecond SLA and P95, you cannot really um, allow queries to be arbitrary queries because you don't want to get a structure query that will go and chase the graph nodes left and right and then it takes more and then you time out. You would be extremely angry if say, I mean, we're all extremely angry when, when Siri says like, I'm on it, on it, on it. Usually you know that nothing will come back from this. It will time out. And in this case, it's a question is like, how do you erect a service that is capable of taking all the queries that our users care about, and there are billions of them, but they, have, um, they are kind of safe queries. They are queries that are guaranteed to end in certain SLA. And for that, we build our own DSL, we call it KGQ, and it, you know, it looks something like this, it, the ability to get what we call intents, and these intents has arguments, and then the question will be, can you land on the right intents? So when I say, what are the children of Obama's, like what are the names of the children of Obama? I need to understand what kind of intent you're interested in, what are the entities you're interested in, and then I can translate that to a, a KGQ that will, you know, poke the graph, get the answers, and give it to you. Uh, because you have an, an interesting end-to-end -end, uh, system in Apple, then you actually can do also conversational things. So you can say here, for example, who's Beyonce married to? Then you know that you're talking about the spouse intent of Beyonce the entity. But then when I say, how about Tom Hanks? Because I just asked about the intent of uh, spouse of, you're probably asking about the spouse of Tom Hanks as well. So you can enable conversational kind of um, uh, dialogue uh, with question answering. Again, it shouldn't be um, uh, uh, kind of surprising to you that we can do this because you're probably playing with Siri features like that. So I'm gonna end this by a bunch of exciting use cases and tell you where is the machine learning in all of this. So, so far, I constructed a graph, very, very large graph. It has knowledge about everything you can imagine, about every song, every book, every article, every iPod. And it's kind of integrated from many sources, from Forbes, from Wikidata, from internal data and Apple, like Apple Music and apps and so on, and from data that we bought, and from data we extracted from the open web. And all of that talking about these main entities. We put it in a query engine capable of embedding this graph into embedding uh, spaces or querying the graph and it's now if s staying behind an efficient access layer. The question is can you use it now into um, a little bit direct use cases that might appeal to all of us. And I'm gonna focus on it today about the semantic annotation services. One of the uh, big challenges in semantic annotation is the tail. So when I tell you Virginia Hefferman was born in Hanover, and I ask you to find this Hanover, landing on the most popular Hanover will tell you Hanover, Germany. But because I know Virginia Heffern Hefferman, um, other attributes, like for example, her degree, her childhood, her birthplace, 
uh, sorry, her, um, her childhood, whatever other properties are in the graph, I can use this context to land on a tail entity in the graph, which is Hanover, Hampshire, which has probably zero other celebrities linked to, uh, uh, but, but this particular one. And why this is important, because we're all doing okay in the head. It's the tail when you come to question answering from KG that um, separate you from, for example, big language models or like direct retrieval, because pretty much every, day, every answer is on, the, is on the web. But the tail becomes, becomes challenging. And in order to do this, we have this kind of neural um, uh, model that we call um, entity candidate retrieval. And basically, it's built on this view engine that I told you about for the graph. So it uses embeddings from the graph, representation, a context for every entity. And the model looks you know, fairly simple. Every context, for example, the context here is Virginia Hefferman was born. And the uh, mention that you would like to uh, annotate is Hanover. And now we have candidates for every entity in the graph that you might think related to this. But the entity themselves have context. And then all of these get um, in these kind of embedding spaces. And now in, you can train a model pretty easily uh, to find the correct um, Hanover or correct candidate uh, using just a, a, a normal transformer uh, kind of architecture if you, if you get these kind of uh, representation right. So the trick here is not in the model structure. The trick here is to representation of what you mean by a context such this model can pick it up. So here is a bunch of use cases uh, as well. So for question answering, when I say how many students did Michael Jordan have, uh, you would like to land on Michael Jordan, the professor, not Michael Jordan, the basketball player, because I'm talking about students. Uh, so that's the context that I'm talking about. When you say something like who directed Harry Potter and Saucer Stone, because I said directed, I don't want you to land on the book because the book doesn't get directed, but the movie uh, does, even if the book is a little bit more um, uh, popular. And uh, so that KG services that is powering most of question answering uh, when you talk to Siri and you say the word knowledge on top and you get these direct answers sometimes, uh, these, this platform is the one that's kind of providing these answers uh, to you. Another interesting one, which is semantic annotation on web documents. So besides the query and annotating the query itself, sometimes we go and annotate every unstructured piece of information that we have to help with web ranking, to help with um, recommendation, to help with putting the right song in front of you, for example, but also to help with search on the web. Same technique exactly. And uh, the question here is, um, is scale, and, and uh, we're not ready to talk about this yet, but there will be a bunch of work coming on how to annotate uh, web scale documents with a web scale uh, knowledge graph. There is a interesting engineering uh, uh, problems there that we're gonna be talking about soon. And then I'm gonna probably end by a very interesting use case that you might not uh, get it a lot in, in academia or other use cases, at least I didn't see it. Um, even if you have a bunch of facts about a celebrity, for example, and I say, um, what are the occupation of Taylor Swift? If you go to Wikidata, you'll find 12 occupations or more for Taylor Swift. She's a philanthropist, she's, you know, she's a singer, she has done things, and people just keep adding to those. If you ask, uh, for example, Wikidata about how many facts they know about Eiffel Tower, there will be 120 facts. So the question is, can you rank these facts based on their importance, and is this rank stable enough for user experience? So every time you ask about this entity, you don't get a bunch of random facts about it. At the end of the day, the phone is a, your phone is a, a, a limited real estate, and I don't have place to show the 120 facts. I just have to pick the most important one. And there we use uh, the same graph embedding that I was talking about, and there is a system called Marius, uh, an open source from, from my co-founder, um, uh, Theo, and, and his students. And that's capable of, that's pretty much one of the most efficient graph embedding systems out there. And we use it to embed the whole graph. And then uh, things like the most relevant fact to an entity becomes a, uh, a simple nearest neighbor in, in that embedding spaces. Again, interesting stuff going on there, Allah, I can tell you about. Uh, finally, a hint of why we, we, we need to use these machine learning models on top of the graph. At the end of the day, uh, your device is also running a personal knowledge graph. 
And there we need linking models, very similar to the linking models that we need off the server that I didn't talk about much today, but I'm sure more, more of, most of you know what a linking model is. This is a model that takes two entities and give you a decision, are they the same or not? And, and they usually train on the similarity of the certain features and then they combine them in a, in a learned function. But you cannot do the same on device. So what we do is we use this power on the server to build neural, small neural uh, linking models that we can ship on the device to, for example, disambiguate your contacts or link uh, uh, duplicates and stuff like that in your contacts. So tons of application and the idea today is to just introduce you to what is the Apple Knowledge uh, Graph team is doing. It's a, it's, a, it's a growing team, just started two years ago. Uh, super excited about the team and, um, and as a conclusion, Continuous construction and serving of knowledge graph is really exciting. It's a CS complete problem. It's machine learning, ML sys, ML models, data systems, data integration, streams, you know, what have you. you we probably, the only thing we don't do is robots but, or, 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 or self-driving, but uh, the previous talk handled that. So between these two talks, you have everything in CS. KG construction, ingestion, entity linking, graph fusion, query services, uh, we insist on this concept of knowledge views. You never let the original graph out, but you build this uh, strong view engine behind it. And semantic annotation is one of the key machine learning services that people use for this graph. Thank you, and um, I'm gonna be hanging around a little bit for, for questions. So any questions here? Hi, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so you were talking about uh, linking entities to give it a context so that you get the right answer at the end of the day, right? How about personalization? Because what I am interested in, uh, in terms of Michael Jordan, for example, may not be the same as what somebody else is interested in. This is a great question. And in fact, it becomes uh, super important when we're talking about the device because that, uh, I didn't talk about it here, but there is a whole personalization layer because the, when I ask about, for example, songs by a certain uh, celebrity or a certain um, artist, uh, that song can be uh, huge and I would like you to uh, recommend the best one for me. That re-ranking of the entities is done by two things. Uh, generic re-ranking on the server, the most relevant to your query but then personalization re-ranking on the device that is very, like what you're gonna see on your device. And that not only your interest, but depends on what's your time of the day, where are you, and so many other signals that we know. One of the good things about Apple is because owning the ecosystem allows us to understand more about you. What we insist about is privacy and, and how to deal with um, recommendation personalization without sending all your stuff to the server, which we don't do. And that push a lot of this processing to be completely on device and never leave the device. So personalization is done entirely on the user's device. So, so when you're sending these neural, uh, mini neural networks to the device, and you run the personalization on the device, is that what you're saying? There is a lot of re-ranking that happens solely on the device, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my question is, would it be useful for intent generators to become aware of and react to um, misuse of words by users? Uh, so but, would they use for what, sorry? Misuse of words. So for example, going back to the Michael Jordan example, um, the question was, who are the students of Michael Jordan? Let's say the misuse was, who are the mentees of Michael Jordan? Let's say source was out there saying, Kobe Bryant is the mentee of Michael Jordan. And uh, misuse of words happens in queries. Or would it be useful to become aware of that and react to it? So, yeah, I'm having hard missing keywords in the no misuse of words. So instead of saying student, the user wanted to mean mentee. Oh, like synonyms and stuff like that. I'm, I'm for some reason I cannot hear the word. I'm I, okay. Misuse of words. So. Um, the, in the question of who are the students of Michael Jordan. Correct. If the user meant who are the mentees of Michael Jordan, you can provide a more accurate answer. I see. So I don't want to get a lot into the kind of the, you're talking about the intent itself, like how to, to, to land on the right intent given all of these kind of variations in the, in the question answering. And I'll, the simple answer now, we can talk about it offline, is, uh, all of that is in the, what we call the, the entity disambiguation layer. So we take that 
kind of utterances and these mentions. And then when we send it, we're not trying to actually get this mention itself, but more into this KG view that have aliases, uh, close by uh, pronunciations, and, and all of these things. And I might be completely missing your question, but if that's what you mean, then we, if you say the mentees of Mar Ma Michael Jordan, for example, without the word professor or with the professor? Without. Without, so in this case, yeah, so students and mentees off and students off or apprentices off and all of these things will be handled under these kind of semantic uh, representation of this property, which we can handle in our control vocabulary. And I'm happy to chat with you more. No it problem. seems like Thank you have you a very specific much. question. A uh, question about uh, false information. So w w what are filter for false information and what are you going to do if you need to update your model? That's a, I have a whole team that nothing to do but false information. You guys will be surprised how creative people uh, uh, get with insults about uh, uh, celebrities and how many nicknames uh, people that we like get into Wikidata every day. Uh, in fact, we have a, we have a, a record of how many um, escalations to, uh, to, to my boss that we prevented uh, uh, by, by, by not having this. So two, uh, two answers for that. One of those is what we call uh, vandalism models that we run all the time. And this vandalism is like taking with a grain of salt. It's vandalism, false information predictions as much as we can. And it's a very uh, high recall, very low precision. We're actually over um, uh, flagging uh, things by any source we don't know, by any new update of a, for example, author that's first edit in Wikidata, because we don't want all of these public sources to go in. So that's the first thing, like the vandalism. And then it goes to an army of humans that can look into that and either check very quickly. And that these checks do two things. First, it increases the fidelity of our graph, so it becomes training data for something else, but also prevent this false information from going in. There are hard, harder false information, which are kind of disputed things. Ukraine, Russia war, uh, it, it, the Israeli-Palestine conflicts, and all of these things. And there, you cannot say it's false information, but it's more kind of debated information because there are very debated subjects. And oftentimes we do this by, again, lists and lists of things that we either we don't show or we have what we call a neutral uh, view or full attribution. According to X, this happened, but according to Y, this happened. In this case, we get out of that race. The third category are much, much harder false information, which is bias. If you say, for example, give me a random picture of a model and you always get certain demographics, certain color, cert certain ethnicity, then, uh, then basically we're being racist in, in, in giving you a random entity. And these are not false information, but they are biased information. And that was anti-biased models that we do in our query services. So there is not one place in which we get rid of false information. Off, uh, offline, continuous checking of the fidelity of our graph. Online for our input from knowledge, uh, from, from knowledge input. And, uh, and, um, and, and then we hope that the combination kind of incre keep increasing the fidelity of the graph. Does that answer your question? Uh, one more question about boundaries of the model. Uh, do you see some limits like size of model when it's too big and noisy? Because of you know, too much information, you can handle it manually and more you add, more right, noisy right. it's... And Less and less in this domain that I talked about because most of our models are specific. We have linking models, semantic, like one of our biggest models are these semantic annotation models. And it does have this memorization aspect that it kind of try to memorize the whole graph and, and so on. But we, um, um, I, I don't think that the noise ratio kind of like screw it up uh, enough for us to worry about right now. Okay, awesome, if there, yeah. Um, Maybe it's lunch time, so <laughs> if someone wants to have lunch, it's served outside. Okay, sure. Um, uh, one quick question: what, what is the relationship between the regular SQL-based queries and knowledge graphs? Is the relation or? or no, no. I mean, you can. You can. We have a whole SQL interface to our knowledge graph. For example, it sits in OLAP, and you can select all from entity. Like you can imagine hypothetically schematic tables that kind of describe certain verticals. But the idea of knowledge graph, it's not a bunch of tables because if you, it's, a, it's extremely sparse representation about 
gazillion types and so on. So it's a more a data model that is more capable of getting heterogeneous sparse data than dense uh, verticals. But at the end of the day, you can SQL interface with any vertical. So you can reuse the assets that you today have in, uh, in regular. Absolutely, we do, we do it all the time. Most yeah. of these knowledge views are SQL okay. views. Gotcha. Yeah. And then the, the very quick question, where shouldn't we use knowledge graph? I think you shouldn't use knowledge graph when you just want a graph database for a very dense uh, uh, schematized uh, version of the word. In this case, like you, you know, you're using for coolness. Or the other side, we reuse it to represent continuously changing volatile data that is full of hypotheses and facts are not like you're, you're what you're looking at. This is a massive repository of heterogeneous facts. And the only reason you cannot put it in a single table is from data model perspective. So when it lends itself to this data model, that dictates a whole you know, different stack of how to deal with this data. And, uh, and, 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 and so forth. So it's kind of, a, that makes you, sense. I think you would know. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That makes sense. And uh, sorry for keeping you from lunch, and thank you for staying late. I appreciate it, and have a good lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much.